Welcome, everyone. I want to welcome you to the 13th Annual Alumni Association Community Lecture Series. Thanks so much for coming up tonight. Um, I'm going to introduce Linda Gillison. She's the uh, chair and professor of UM Department of um, Modern and Classical uh, Languages and Literature. And uh, Linda will also be our moderator and facilita facilitator tonight. And so that's um, all I got. So thanks very much. I've got a whole series of introductions here, right? Uh, thanks. It's great to see everybody. How many of you have been to this series before? Not this one, but okay. See, they're almost all returners, Chris. They just keep coming back. They keep coming back. It's wonderful to see you all again. Um, I want to just make my usual request that you make sure your, your uh, cell phone is turned off if you have forgotten to do that thus far. Um, I think I'm always asked to introduce people because I introduce very briefly. And so um, the speaker really gets a chance to go on with his, with his talk. And that's why we're all here. I think we're all particularly excited about this series because it's a little bit different from most of the series that we've had. And that is this one, partly at the suggestion of our provost, who is himself a scientist, has to do with science and more particularly brain science. And you can bet that I didn't collect all of these brain scientists because I don't know any except my dean. Uh, so I have to say that Chris Comer has been wonderful in working with us and um, uh, working for us in assembling a wonderful, wonderful set of lecturers. And I think we're all going to learn a lot this time. I personally have never heard any of these people lecture, I think, so I'm really excited about it. Our first lecturer is Chris Comer, who's standing over there on the other side of the room in the dark, but he'll come over here soon. Um, he happens, I know him best as the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and since I'm a department chair, we work together pretty closely. Uh, Chris is a scientist. Uh, he also cherishes all branches of intellectual, um, intellectual endeavor, however, and uh, that's really what we need in a College of Arts and Sciences, so we're very pleased to have him working there with us. Um, Dr. Comer came to us from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Some of you may know that campus. Uh, he had served as a faculty member there. He was also the director of the Integrative Neuroscience uh, Center. And I think his last role was at, as the dean of the liberal arts and sciences there. So uh, he came from a job much like uh, the one which he's taken on, and, and I think his experience has served us well. Uh, he's interested in all kinds of scientific inquiry, and I noticed that he's been away for, I think, a week or so off in England reading a paper, uh, and he promises to tell us about whisker stimulation tonight, so I'm really excited about that. I don't know how you're feeling about it, but you know what? I, how good can it get? Um, so I'm just going to uh, just say that Chris is a wonderful scientist. He is continuing to be, as I think everybody expected when he came here, a lively, active scholar. He encourages all of us to be scholars. He encourages our students to be scholars. Um, and we're just really pleased to have him here. He will be um, both giving this lecture tonight and introducing the last series, the, la the last uh, session of the series, the last session will be a panel discussion amongst all of our um, lecturers. How many, I think all of our lecturers for the series are here. Are you all here? Would you mind standing up if you're a lecturer in this series and, uh, and you're here for the first one? I saw Ashby Kent. Okay, so here are two, three, four. Right, so is that it? That's it, so all four of our lecturers here. Let's give them a, a big hand. Okay, so I've overstayed my welcome. I just want to introduce to you, I'm very happy to do this, uh, Dr. Chris Comer. Chris. Thanks, Linda. First thing I have to check is, can you hear me okay throughout the room? Can you put the sound up? How's that? Okay. Uh, the first thing, whoa. <laughs> the first thing I want to do is uh, issue some thank yous. And, and lots of them are needed for a talk like this. First of all, I want to thank the Alumni Association, the folks that, uh, starting with Ann Boone and, and company, that got us together to talk about this series of lectures was, uh, was a really good group of discussions. And I want to thank the, 
the um, other scientists that are participating in this with me. There's four of them uh, directly involved. And in every case, when I contacted them and said, would you be willing to come out and give this lecture, there was no hesitation. They all said yes right away. It just gives you a sense of the way people think on this campus and how excited they are to be out and share um, information about um, what they care about intellectually. Um, the, this thing really changes, doesn't it? On, Yeah, I'll just leave it in my pocket. Lower that. Lower that. Lower it. Okay. I'll try not to turn my head. I, I do, however, tend to walk around when I speak, and so that'll be a little bit of a challenge, but I'll see what I can do. Um, one of the things I want to do is tell you that at the start here, I've brought a few materials that you might find interesting. So let me point these out. Um, the library on the campus has very kindly worked with us to try to make materials available for everyone during these lectures. I'm just going to hold this because that's more comfortable for me. And um, one of the things they're doing is making this available online. So you can go to the university uh, website, you can go to the library, and you can find information on these lectures. Um, there's two things I wanted to call your attention to. Um, there's a couple of references on there for a couple of organizations around the country that specialize in providing material to the public about brain science. And some of them are excellent. One of them is this book here called Brain Facts. And this is an old copy. There's a newer version out now. This is meant to inform the intelligent public about what's going on these days in brain science. It's downloadable free uh, from the Society for Neuroscience. It's a wonderful resource. So if you're interested, Please go ahead and uh, download it. It would be good background on some of the lectures and just interesting information. It covers the brain and health and the brain and disease. Lots of questions get answered, so it's a good source. Uh, next, um, this is also downloadable from the Dana Foundation. And this is a, a book that's actually about neuroscience and education. And that's really where we're going with this series of talks. By the last session, we're going to be talking about the implications of understanding the brain for how we educate teachers, for how we teach in the classroom, and how we run uh, high schools and, and colleges. And we're going to be joined for, for that session by some teachers from MCPS and from some faculty and the dean of the College of Education here. So I expect that to be a really exciting, lively uh, discussion. So you might check this out. And last but not least, there's some sheets up here with uh, references for today's lecture. So if you're interested, feel free to take one. Um, what I want to do tonight is uh, this, the lecture section is called The Beauty of the Brain. So I've chosen material in part to tell a series of stories about insights into the way the brain works that I think ultimately will lead to our larger discussions about learning, flexibility in the brain, and the implications for education. Uh, but I've also chosen the material in part because it's stuff that I think is cool and looks interesting and is beautiful. So there's a little bit of a, um, a method to my madness here in what I've chosen. And I hope I get through this in a timely fashion so you can sort of digest it and ask questions. But I do want to um, alert you. I have no problem with being stopped and ask questions in the middle. I mean, if I said something that doesn't make sense, please stop me and ask, and I'll be glad to explain. I, last thing I want to do is uh, talk around you and not give you the information that you really want. OK, so here's the three big questions that I want to address tonight. The first of these is, how similar are the brains of various living organisms? Um, that might seem like a strange question, but until recently, we hadn't looked inside the heads of many organisms to find out what the brains were like. And we didn't even know much about how a human brain, for example, compared to, say, an orangutan brain or um, uh, something like a Tenerec. Um, lots of information out there we'd like to know. And across all animals, what's this look like? So I'll give you some background information on that. Secondly, a question I think is really important and very fundamentally uh, central to thinking about education. How fixed are brain circuits? Um, there's lots of mythology out there. One of the things I hope to do tonight is to start breaking down some of the mythology. You hear statements about how many brain cells you have, what happens to kill them, whether or not you can replace them. There's a lot of misinformation out there, and I'm going to try to start the record. I'm sure my colleagues will finish it, explaining some of the newer information on how fixed the brain's functions really are. Um, and last but not least, what are the implications of brain facts for thinking about the educational process? And that's something that we hope you will have opinions on. And by the time we get to the final session, 
um, you'll be in a, a mood to ask lots of good questions of all the folks that are up here. So let's get started. First thing I want to do is clear up one misconception. Um, all biologists think about evolution. It's central to our discipline. It's a bit like gravitation for a physicist. But I'm constantly dismayed that out there in the general um, public, sometimes it's misrepresented. And I can't point the fingers at others because I've heard scientists speak about it in a sloppy way that doesn't explain the facts. So I just wanted to make sure I showed you this so there'd be no confusion about this. Um, over here, I'm sorry, over on that side, the left, is what is the wrong theory. And that is the idea that human beings descended from monkeys. Um, Darwin never said that. That's not evolutionary theory. That's not what biologists believe. The theory of evolution simply states that all living things are related. And so it means that human beings share some distant ancestry with other animals. And in fact, our closest relatives we know from lots of information are chimpanzees. And we didn't descend from chimpanzees, but chimpanzees descended from an earlier life form that we also descended from. So we're sort of cousins, if you want to think of it that way. But sometimes, unfortunately, we tend to slip and make it sound as if we descended from monkeys and nothing could be further from the truth. So that's the shape of it. Um, I'm not going to go in the, um, the details of that uh, family lineage on the right, but we'll get back there in a little bit before the lecture is over to talk a little bit about some of the forms that preceded humans and what their mental capacities might have been like. OK. Um, this is a slide that is meant to show you the continuity of an intellectual field. On the left is a figure that's on a histology textbook that I pulled off my shelf at home. And the book is, is fun because it's old. It was published in 1917. And that's a picture of a nerve cell. To the right is a picture that was taken out of that book I just showed you called Brain Facts, which was published just a few years ago. And that's also a picture of a nerve cell. And if you notice, they look awfully similar. Um, the basic parts are there. Um, this sort of figure is in most general biology textbooks, most general psychology textbooks. It's everywhere. There's a lot of truth in this picture, but there's a lot that's not accurate as well. Um, so for example, this particular neuron happens to be the kind of neuron that's in our spinal cord and controls the contractions of our muscle. That's, it's got that shape and form. And so that picture gets reproduced again and again and again, but in fact, Nerve cells come in thousands of different geometries and different shapes and sizes, and that's very important to their function. In neuroscience, the geometry of a nerve cell dramatically influences the way it processes information. And so those subtle differences in geometry are all important, and yet in textbooks we tend to show one picture as if this was the whole story. So in my teaching, I spend a lot of time showing students pictures of the diverse array of nerve cells and how the information processing capacities of our brains are dramatically increased because this isn't the only kind of cell we have. So just so you know, there's nothing wrong with that picture except it's just a tiny slice. In fact, it's a picture of a nerve cell you'd find in a human spinal cord, but since most of the animals on the planet are actually insects, most of their neurons don't look quite like this. Anyway, um, I would call your attention to the inset on the right, and that's a picture of a synapse. And first, I want to talk at that level. The title of the talk is Evolution from Molecules to Mind, so I want to start with some chemistry. I'll go through it quickly, and I just want to give you the flavor of it, not so much to dig into the details, but I'll be glad to answer questions if that becomes uh, of interest. What you see there is the tip of the axon, and the tip of that axon um, has some special contents in it, which um, are vesicles that contain chemicals, and those can be released at the tip of one cell, latch onto an, another cell in the nervous system, and activate it but they can also inhibit it. They don't always turn one on, they can turn a cell off. And last but not least, there are perfectly good cells in our nervous systems that don't use chemical neurotransmission. So once again, this is just a slice of what happens, but it is a common way of communication, and it's actually one that's important practically because most drugs that act on the nervous system act at synapses. They affect the way chemicals pass from one cell to the next, and so that's tremendously important to medical practice. And you'll hear a bit more about that, I'm sure, in the next lecture. OK, so I divided my story into chapters. Each one is brief, so not to worry. The first one is called The Antiquity of Neurochemistry. And the point I want to make here is that if we look across animals, one of the things that is generally true, and of course there's exceptions to it, is that many of the chemicals we find in our brains, we can find in much, much so-called simpler organisms. So 
Let's take a look at a family tree. This is a, a family tree for the animal kingdom from a recent review article. What it shows here is the lineage leading up towards vertebrates on the far left, and there's a mouse shown there as the exemplar of a vertebrate. And then it shows lots of other interesting creatures. Uh, fungi are incredibly basic, so they're shown to the far right. Peripherins over there, those are sponges. Um, those are unicellular. Um, they aggregate. They lack a true nervous system. As you go up there, cnidarians, uh, also quite primitive uh, in <coughs> most people's way of thinking. Sometime between uh, just after the birth of the metazoans, which is multicellular animals, we see the first synapses. So if you wanted to know what was the original communication between cells that would become the nervous system, you'd have to go back to that level and see what's going on. Now, of course, we can't go back there. We don't have any way to do that. But we can look at animals, in some cases, that haven't changed so much since those early times, and we can get an idea of what their nervous systems were like. So what's been done in this case was to show simply that if you look over there, insects, um, mollusks, vertebrates, all of these creatures have roughly similar synaptic structure. And then let's ask the question, what's the chemi chemistry like? What's actually inside those things? So this is a graph that's from a recent review article. When I saw this graph, I almost fell out of my chair. It's a really interesting graph. What this shows is it shows all of the proteins that are in the postsynaptic complex. So there's two partners in a synapse. There's a cell sending information and a cell receiving information. If you look at the receiving neuron, so-called postsynaptic cell, it's doing a lot of information processing. And you can harvest that, and you can break it up, and you can look at the proteins in it. You can even ask what genes have been expressed by looking at the proteins and some other tricks. And what this shows over here is, to the far right, you see humans. So we have mammalian vertebrates, non-mammalian vertebrates, and then the invertebrates. So bees are up there. Fruit flies are up there, zebra fish, frogs, chickens, cows. And if you look at that, it shows you to the far right, 100% is the human index. That means that's all the different unique proteins we pulled out of a synapse from humans. And then what's shown for all those other animals is what percentage of the proteins they have in the synapse are identical or nearly identical to those you see in a human. Now, knowing how complex and differential uh, differentially um, behaving different animals are, you might have expected there'd be wild differences in the proteins expressed at synapses in all these different animals. And yet, if you look at this, it's almost a straight line you can draw across all the vertebrates. There's some variation, but it's rather small, which is to say that if you look at a frog, while it's not identical to a mammal, you're going to see many of the same proteins in those cells. Um, the neurotransmitters themselves, the things squirted from one cell to the next, are also found pretty ubiquitously throughout all the vertebrates. So the basic chemistry is not that different. To see a big change, you have to drop from the vertebrates down to the invertebrates, and then you start to see some differences in the proteins that are present at the synapses. So there's this set of smaller bars over here to the left, and that means that the proteomic, or, or the chemical complexity of the synapses, is a bit different in invertebrates than it is in vertebrates. And I might have expected that these would vary all over the place, maybe even in some systematic fashion. And lo and behold, they're really quite similar. Now, all summaries like this do some uh, danger to some subtle differences that are very important. And I think Rich will probably tell you about some of the things that are found at synapses that are quite important and vary in subtle ways that make a huge difference to things like learning and memory. <coughs> So the answer here, the, the point here is that if we ask the question, how similar are brains across a wide swath of animals at a very micro level of chemistry, they're not that different one from the other. And even at a synapse, which is a very important information processing component of the brain. <clears throat> so how do we get complexity? Well, this is a cartoon, and it gives you an idea of how this might work. Um, and I show it to you just to give you a feel for it. What this shows you is a synapse right here. And that synapse has some blue balls and then a, a red horizontal structure and then some yellow triangles. Those are just stand-ins. Those are cartoon stand-ins for different molecular components of a synapse. Those are the things that receive signals. And most of the complexity at synapses seems to be largely dependent on what's there. 
lots of different proteins expressed, sometimes in big complexes. And they gather signals that are coming in. They process those signals. They store information. They affect the processes of learning. So that's important. And I've just told you that what's in a human brain is pretty similar to many other animals. So then what gives the unique character of a human brain at this chemical level? Well, what it seems to be is if you look at that um, schematized human brain over there, it shows arrows from different color combinations up to different parts of the brain. And what that means is that the basic proteins are the same, but the way they've been combined differs from one location in the brain to the next. So this means it's a combinatorial solution to the problem. You have some basic components, and you can shuffle them in very interesting ways. And when people do gene expression studies and ask what genes get turned on in one part of the brain or the next, they typically find that it's not the same genes being turned on in every location. There are subtle differences. And once again, here's the bottom line message. Very subtle differences in this chemical expression can lead to very big changes. Because after all, these differences between a human brain and a chimp brain and a, a rat's brain are not that great. So the real question that gets interesting for a biologist is, how do you define those small difference that, differences that make all the difference in the way the organism behaves, and maybe it's learning capacity. OK, chapter two. Is behavioral change difficult? We know animals have very different behaviors. What would you have to do to a nervous system to suddenly give an animal a completely new behavioral capacity? <clears throat> now I'm going to rely on some data from my own laboratory. And I should say here, uh, anytime you show data from your own laboratory, you have to point out most of the data I will show, and I'm only going to show you three slides. I didn't get myself. My students and postdocs got it. And I want to mention very prominently Yoshi Baba, who uh, has been a postdoc in my lab for years and really was uh, utterly important in getting the data I'm going to show you. <clears throat> this is a picture of brain cells from three different insects. And the species are shown up at the top there. Lacusta migratoria is the common locust. Um, Purplinita americana is the common cockroach. And Gryllus bimaculatus is a cricket. We've kept all these different species in the laboratory, and they're closely related. They're near cousins, so to speak, in evolutionary terms. So we've been interested in how their brain circuits are organized and what differences we can find from one species to the next that explain their different behavioral capacities. So on the left there, Lacusta migratoria, what that is is a picture of the brain that we could see this under the microscope. We had injected that neuron with a tracer a chemical compound that we could precipitate, and then we can see the cell in all its glorious anatomy under the microscope. And that cell, it turns out, is a very famous nerve cell. It was the first uniquely identifiable nerve cell that was ever published. So way back in the 60s, somebody was working with a locust, poked a microelectrode in there and pumped dye into it, and said, not only can I see this cell, but every locust I find has exactly this cell right there. This is kind of an interesting idea because when you have billions of neurons in a complex brain, one often wonders, do the cells have a unique identity? We can't answer the question quite exactly in a human, but in humbler creatures with smaller brains, it's very clear that they have very exact neural circuits and the cells have unique identities. And I'll come back to that again at the end of the talk. So this is really valuable from a scientific point of view because if I want to do an experiment on a mammalian brain cell, I actually don't know from one day to the next which cell I've been working on. It's just some cell that I happen to get. In a locust, I can go back to this cell called DCMD, Descending Contralateral Movement Detector, day after day, find the exact same genetically identical cell. There's its anatomy. Now, we didn't study this to just go back and study its anatomy because it had already been described, but we studied it because we wanted to find out, does the cockroach have the same cell and does the cricket have the same cell? And by an exhaustive list of physiological tests, we believe the cell shown in the middle for the cockroach and the cell shown to the right for the cricket are the exact same cell. They fire in very specific ways for approaching visual targets. They have very interesting visual dynamics that are signature. So we're absolutely sure these are the same cells. But notice the anatomy of the cells is not identical. You're looking at the brain and the other two as well. The same cells have also been pumped full of dye. And if you look at it, you can see that there's a blue area circle for all the cells. We know from other studies that that's an area where information from the eye comes into the brain and turns on that cell. 
This is a visual neuron response to moving targets out in the world. It turns out the cockroach and the cricket have one subtle but really important difference. They have that little branch off the cell that's circled in red. We know what that branch does. That branch is not a sensory branch, it's a motor branch. The information in the cell is sent along that branch and there's a population of motor neurons that are sitting there. These are cells that go out into the base of the antenna and cause the antennal muscles to move and therefore to move the animal's antenna. So this is a neuron that gets a visual signal and then has the ability to turn on the cells which will activate movements of the antenna. The locust doesn't have this. Interesting biological difference between, anybody know the real salient difference between locusts and cockroaches? Locusts have stubby antennae. Cockroaches have glorious long antennae that are about one and a half times body length. <coughs> so what happens is locusts don't have these gorgeous visual reflexes where they can locate things with their antenna. Crickets and cockroaches do. And the reason they do it is because the cell in the brain grew one extra process. So on the glorious grand anatomy of this nervous system, this is a really subtle cellular detail. But over evolution, it gave rise to an entirely new behavioral capacity in crickets that isn't present in locusts, even though they're close cousins. So let me show you what this looks like. This is actual footage from the laboratory. This is, a, this is a visual response in a cricket. Did you see that? It's a little bit subtle. I'll play it again. His left antenna is held in front of him. And when a visual target pops in the, in the field, he turns and touches it. There it is. So oddly enough, this particular behavioral capacity wasn't really known about until about 10 years ago. And it turns out that we now know it's present in a whole variety of insects, and it depends on those cells. And it's not present in all insects. And when it is present, it seems to be the re-engineering of the outputs of that cell. So how would that happen? Well, from studies in Drosophila, we know that there's a whole family of genes that, if they're expressed, cause cells to send extra branches as they develop. And we don't know in this case, because we haven't done the genetics, but it's most likely that as much as one gene being changed in its expression pattern could have led to that cell sending out an extra branch and now making a functional connection to the motor system for the antenna. So subtle change, major new behavioral capacity. Okay, so this is just a, a summary of that. Um, it shows physiology from these cells in the cockroach and the cricket. They both respond alike. You pop something in the visual field and what those recordings show is nerve impulses, the little electrical discharges that the cell gives when it's been stimulated. In this case, connected to the eye, stimulated by a visual moving object. And here's our evolutionary model. The cells all have this branch shown in blue where they get visual input. In some cases, they've grown an extra branch over evolutionary time. And then those cells have the ability to drive that motor output. And it turns out these cells are massive, and they have lots of other branches in other parts of the nervous system. And there's lots of other chapters to this story, but I'm not going to take the time to tell you now. OK, let's move to bigger brains. Chapter 3. Um, bigger brains present a whole different set of problems, but the same questions can be asked. How similar are they? How fixed are the connections? And what I want to do here is tell you a tale of two rodents. Um, what's shown on the left is a common laboratory mouse. That's a C57 black mouse. And on the right is a lovely creature called a naked mole rat. Um, you may have seen these in zoos. It turns out we have a colony here on the campus. And they're really fascinating creatures, quite different from the mouse. Let me just point out a few of their features. Um, notice the prominent whiskers on a mouse. Um, that's a very important sensory apparatus that's deeply represented in the brain. Also notice the, um, the mole rat to the right. Um, it's a little hard to tell, but it has some pretty unusual features. Look at those very large teeth. Those are incisors. And you can't quite see it here, but the mouth is actually behind the teeth. So these are teeth that are not inside the buccal cavity. They are outside. 
In addition, the two bottom teeth are independently movable. They're prehensile teeth. And the reason is because these are blind mammals that live underground, and they dig with those teeth. So if you had your teeth inside your mouth, it'd be hard to dig without getting food in your gullet. So it's very important to have switched this around. Quite often, you can learn things by looking at two closely related animals that have solved some environmental problem in a different way. So here's what we know about these guys. OK. This may not work, and I may have to switch out of this momentarily. But what I wanted to show you was something equivalent to what you just saw in the cockroach, but in a mammal. And this is what happens when an animal um, has its whisker stimulated. So you saw the prominent whisker display in the, in the rodents. Let's see if this works. Probably won't. So what you would have seen here was, <laughs> it was really lovely. The, um, the way you record brain activity these days has changed a lot. In the old days, you always had to poke an electrode into a cell. And that's a bit of a tricky thing, because you can't see the cell before you try to run the electrode into it. Nowadays, it's a much kinder, gentler world. You can actually um, place a voltage-sensitive dye over the cortex. And you just have to look through a tiny window in the skull. And if you stimulate the animal, the voltage-sensitive dye will emit a fluorescent signal. And you can just optically sense where there's activity in the brain. I was going to show you an example of that. but. We'll just skip that for now. Um, an active touch was to show you that, just like with the cockroach, if you show a mouse something interesting, they will project their whiskers toward it and then move it. And you see very interesting patterns of activation in the brain. Um, but here's what I wanted to get to. Um, after showing the behavior, which was more just for the fun of it, I wanted to show you what the brain looks like in a mouse. So that left-hand side there is a common laboratory rat. Um, the mouse is quite similar, although not identical. And what it shows you there is an area called S1. So if you were to look through the skull, take one side of the skull off, you'd see that area. It isn't color-coded in the animal, of course. Um, and what you see there are some gray fields with lots of black dots. Each one of those black dots represents a group of cells that responds if you touch one whisker. And on each side of the face, there are on the order of 40 or so whiskers. So it turns out that there's a, a matrix or an array where there's clumps of cells processing information from each of the whiskers. And the first time people saw this back in the, I guess it was the early 70s, they were quite amazed at this. Nobody had seen quite this dramatic organization in the cortex before. Um, and interesting uh, piece of information there, there are actually several of those fields. So there's not just one array covering the whiskers. There's about four to five different regions, each of which is independently processing different kinds of um, spatial and temporal properties off those whiskers, which is a way of saying the whiskers are really important to rodents. Now remember, rodents are pretty much nocturnal. They're active under very low light conditions. They have to navigate the world with non-visual cues. So having a very sensitive vibrissal system is absolutely essential to their survival. If you look to the right, that's a mapping of the brain of the naked mole rat. Now, naked mole rats have a much simpler um, area of S1. And S1 just stands for primary somatosensory. That's where their cells are that respond to touch. But they don't have as rich a whisker uh, field. They have one instead of five. So much less processing of whisker information. But what's mostly in there is processing of the teeth. So there's an enormous representation of those two incisors. And many, many cells, probably 40% of the, co of the cortical area, is responding to just the signals from those teeth, those digging apparatus. You think of it, it's a little bit like a hand for us where we do really crucial things with our hand. There's a massive representation of our hands in the brain. So there's a common way to look at this, which just brings it back home in a way that everybody can relate to, which is take the information that's represented in the brain and draw a character of the organism, scaling all the parts on the body to the amount of brain tissue that monitors that part of the body. So if you had a huge set of brain cells taking care of the hand, this creature would have a large hand. Um, if uh, it turns out when this was first done, it was done by uh, Edgar Adrian back in the 30s, I think. He studied the cortex of a pig. It turns out there's an enormous representation of the snout of a pig. It makes sense. That's really important to the pig lifestyle. <laughs> so here we go for naked mole rats. If you draw it, you see over there on the left, there's this, that's a, a mole rat unculus. That's 
about the proportions. There's a pretty good representation of the, of the uh, hind and, and rear feet. There's an enormous representation of those uh, incisors because they're so vital to the animal's life. And in fact, what I put over there for reference is that's the human homunculus. Once again, this is found commonly in biology and psychology textbooks. But if you look at the area in our brains that represents different body parts, there's an enormous overrepresentation of the hands. And there's an enormous overrepresentation of the face and the lips and the tongue. Of course, we're vocal creatures and we do very, very fine manipulations. So you can tell from looking at the map what's behaviorally significant to the organism. And in fact, if you look across a variety of mammals and you look at their maps, all you have to do is look at the brain map and you can tell exactly what kind of behavioral niche they live in in the world. It's absolutely one for one. It's perfect. So the brain is reflecting what the lifestyle of the animal actually is. Okay. Now, I just want to look at the dynamics. I want to turn to the question of how fixed information is in the brain and how the circuits may or may not be flexible. And I'm going to use the same system. Um, I threw this picture in there just for fun. Uh, this is a newer technique. You know, in the old days, I referred to having to find a cell blind and inject a, a chemical into it. Nowadays, what you do is you genetically engineer the animal so that some of the cells express fluorescent proteins naturally, and then you can see them under the microscope. And this is one of those cells. It's also turned out that they've engineered it genetically so that there's a rabies, piece of rabies virus in it. And the yellow thing you can see there, and because of the lighting, you probably can't see all of its glorious processes, but they're pretty extensive. Um, that cell is enmeshed in thousands and thousands of other cells, but the cells it's connected to are labeled red. So there's a special compound that's in that yellow cell. It diffuses through one synapse through that chemical connection to a nearby cell, and any cell that that cell is talking to is now in red. So in the old days, it could have taken God knows how many person hours to record from a cell and try to poke your electrodes around and find out who else is talking to that neuron. And now you can use molecular genetic tricks to get a visual picture of exactly how the cells are connected. The reason I'm showing you this is partly because it's beautiful, but partly because it looks like a very fixed structure. And for a century, we've been looking at nerve cells as if they were fixed structures. So what I want to show you is that that's far from the truth. And this is the one I really want you to see, so I hope this will work. What I'm going to do, I don't want to uh, break tempo here, I'm going to come back, I'll fix this at the very end and I'll come back and I'll show it to you because it's quite dramatic. Um, what it is is a series of photographs taken of a nerve cell, as you can see in a pyramidal neuron in a, a young mouse. And what they did is they photographed about 10 minutes worth of its life and then they made it into a movie. And it turns out that the cell is moving all over the place. And this isn't a one in a million. This is the way most cells in the cortex are behaving at this point in life. They're extremely dynamic. And this is something that wasn't appreciated. Certainly when I was in graduate school, we didn't know this. It's only emerged over the last 10 or 15 years that a typical nerve cell, certainly at certain points in an animal's lifespan, are dramatically mobile. And they're moving around, tasting the environment, forming, breaking, and remaking connections in a way that we never dreamed of before. So I'll come back to that and show it to you because it's worth it. Let me, however, just show you that at a finer level, there's another way to look at the details here. This is back to the same part of the brain I was telling you before where the, the whiskers are represented. And it just shows that to the left and to the right, there's one neuron that's been labeled with a special fluorescent tag. And then it shows you with those boxes where we're going to zoom in and look at the details. So here it is. This is um, mouse cortex. Um, the PND up there, it says PND 16, that's postnatal day 16. And then each picture is of the exact same process every uh, day over that approximately one week period. So 16, 17, 18, 19. And the beauty of this technique is once a cell is uniquely expressing a tag, you can go back and find that exact same neuron one day to the next to the next and ask, has it changed? Is its structure stable or not? Now from that white line, which is the fluorescing nerve cell process going across the field, you can see that its basic structure is the same. It's there every day, it's in the same place, it looks to have the same geometry. But if you look at those arrows, notice the 
yellow arrows point to two little blebs coming off the side of that process. Um, those are um, special structures where synapses are made. They're called spines. And most cortical neurons have thousands of those. And what this shows is that the spines at those spots with the yellow arrows were the same every day the cell was sampled. So some of those are incredibly stable from day to day. But the ones, if you follow there um, on day 19, day 20, there's some red and blue ones that pop up because there's some new spines that are growing out there. You see them there over days 21, 22, and then they go away by day 25. So they're transient. They're there for a while, then they go away. Now that's a level that's much finer than the movie I was going to show you. But the reason that's important is because we know that many important classes of synapses, the connections, are made not randomly on the cell, but on the spine. So when you see spines changing, it means the connectional information of that cell has changed. And one of the things we believe to be true is that sometimes during dramatic change in the brain, you'll see kinds of structural changes like this that reflect adaptive changes in the way the brain is wired. So the nice thing is we can see this now. We can measure it. We can see how profound it is. Oh, and by the way, really important question for all of us, any of us who are over about 15 years of age, we hear again and again <coughs> that the brain is very flexible in the young. And as we age, it becomes less flexible. This is postnatal day 18 through 25. That's relatively young. However, this same paper, they showed the exact same information for postnatal day 200, 210. So it's very clear that this kind of plasticity is not only happening in neonates, it's happening much later in life. And all of the evidence we have lately suggests that the idea that plasticity is only for the young brains is not true that older brains retain a significant amount of plasticity. There was a question there. Yes? Do the spines occur on axons and dendrites? They occur mostly on dendrites. Yeah. OK. <clears throat> this is the penultimate chapter. This is just the quirks of humanity. Obviously, we have some very special features to our nervous system. So let me go through that very uh, quickly. Um, one of the things that's, that's certainly true about humans that's important is just the overall size of the brain. Um, we have very large brains in an absolute sense, by no means the largest on the planet. Um, but brain size generally scales with body size. And nonetheless, for our body size, we still have inordinately large brains. So what this shows is, um, I'm sorry, it shows as a function of body weight what the endocranial volume is. That's the size of the cranial cavity in which the brain sits, and it's an indirect measure of brain size. You can see here that um, chimpanzees are down here. Uh, there's a line of dotted colored spots that go up towards Neanderthals and modern-day humans. So that's the lineage that goes up towards humans. And as that lineage is being played out, brain size is systematically increasing. But this doesn't have a time scale. It just says scale to body size. So let me show you the time scale. Time scale is shown here. So time is on the horizontal axis, and that's millions of years before the present. And then the volume of the brain is shown on the vertical axis. And what you can see here is that Australopithecines, which are dated to, oh, three to five million years ago, and clearly our ancestors, we have lots of fossils from them, um, have pretty small brains, a little bit over 400 cc's, which is not terribly large. As you go out here, um, you get to Homo erectus. That was the first um, hominid creature that actually exited Africa, um, started colonizing the, uh, Europe and parts of Asia. Um, they had a larger brain size, perhaps about 1,000 cc's. And then you go out there and you see modern-day humans to the far right. And you can see there that um, there's a diversity of brain sizes. Um, but in fact, overall cranial uh, capacity is about 1,400 cc's. Now, I don't want to make too much out of cranial capacity because as you'll notice, there's a difference in average cranial capacity between men and women, and we all know that that has no significance whatsoever. <laughs> so small changes here probably, once again, don't make a difference. But what's interesting here is there are actually two jumps in brain size. So if you look at this graph, if you try to imagine drawing a line through there, just after two million years before the present, there's kind of a jump. And those points go off the horizontal line. And <clears throat> then things stay pretty constant for about two million years. 
or maybe one and a half million years, and then suddenly there's another jump, which is actually the last 35 to 50,000 years. So this is interesting because it means there were two different events giving rise to our larger brain. And we don't know exactly what those were. We have some ideas. Anthropologists spent a lot of time trying to figure out what was going on in a cultural or proto-cultural way during these events. And biologists are trying to figure out what was going on biologically in terms of genes that were being expressed. But <clears throat> the story is not simple in the sense that it's not a simple increase in brain size. It happened at least twice. And some of the genes that are being turned on differentially here to cause this, the ones we know best are all recent, the ones that happened in the last 40 or 50,000 years. We know much less about what might have been happening two million years ago. <clears throat> but here's one of the things that happened. Um, the cortex of the brain dramatically expanded. This is something you've probably heard before, and this is, I think, a convenient way to just know about that. What it shows you is the amount of cortical surface. Cortex is the top of the brain. When you open the brain case, that's the first thing you see. Um, in a rat, it's fairly large for a rat brain. It's quite smooth, and the surface area in this particular diagram is meant to be about the size of a postage stamp. And if you scaled the cortical surface in a rat to be a postage stamp, then on that scaling, for a standard monkey, like a New World monkey, it would be about the size of a piece of note paper. So it's much larger surface area. If you go to a chimpanzee, it would be about the size of a piece of legal paper, quite a bit larger. Suddenly, when you go from chimpanzee grade to human grade, it's four times that. And as you know, the brain takes on lots of crenulations and uh, sulci and gyri because you're compressing a huge surface area into not a very large cranium. So it has to have these um, rivulets to sort of crunch the whole thing together. But because the circuitry is arrayed along that surface, that increased surface area means an enormous increase in information processing capacity. OK, what about language? Um, very important to us as human beings, something that in terms of uh, our phenotype, syntactical language processing is something that's rather unique to humans. Um, something that's shown here on the left is a classic picture from um, neurological studies of humans to show that we know language capacity in some way depends in a special sense on what's going on in the left side of the brain. And it shows an area called the planum temporale, which is shaded in and cross-hatching there. And it's much larger on the left side of the brain in most people than it is on the right. We also know from physiological studies that the cells there are processing sound information in a way that's relevant to speech. And it's obviously very important to the control of speech in humans. So that's a specialization we think of as being rather unique to our niche as human beings. The question is, when did that arise in evolution? Well, about 10 years ago, somebody thought to get enough specimens from chimpanzees and asked the question, do they show this asymmetry with a larger left planum temporale? And what's shown there on the right is a study from chimpanzees to show that, in fact, they have a very similar asymmetry. Now, chimpanzees don't use language, at least not a vocal language. Recent work suggests that they actually have a fairly rich gestural language, um, and they do make some vocal calls, but nothing like a syntactical language that uh, humans have. So this is really interesting, because it suggests the reason for the asymmetry in the brain is not language per se, because it was there before language arose. So it's one of those mysteries that is not yet solved. Um, there's some interesting speculations these days about why it came up. I suspect it has to do with the fact that that part of the brain also has a lot to do with usage of the forelimbs, and especially the hand. And so it may have been involved in gestural communications, or it may have been involved in tool use, which is a very lateralized uh, piece of uh, behavior in most human beings. Um, OK, last but not least, what did genetics tell us about the brain? This is just a, uh, a quick scan to show you what generally is being done these days to find out about when genes may have changed in such a way that they've given us human characteristics. This shows a particular gene that has, I think it's 118 base pairs in chicken. And compared to the chimpanzee, it has the same base pairs, except there's two that are colored blue. And that means that over evolutionary time, those base pairs changed. Now, there's mutations happening all the time. And there's a very predictable rate at which mutations tend to show up. 
when you go from chimpanzees to humans, and that's a very short time in the evolutionary sense, suddenly there's about 17 other base pair changes that have happened. What this means is that there's been a rapid change, an acceleration in the rate of change in the structure of this gene. Now, this is seen all the time and, and at this frequency. We have on the order of 26,000 genes, give or take. There are a small number, perhaps 150 that have been found, that have started to change very dramatically over the past few million years in the human lineage. So the suspicion is that these genes may well be very important to some of the characteristics that make us human. So they're very heavily studied at the moment. Um, that's the logic of, of looking at them, and it gives you a sense of what it means to say something has changed rapidly in a recent time. Um, here's what some of those genes do. There's a normal um, skull shown in an a MRI photograph. There's a gene that's been discovered in this scan of the human genome called ASPM. Uh, what it stands for is not important, but when that gene is not functional, it produces microcephaly. So there's a picture of somebody with a, um, a living human with a brain that's, instead of being 1,400 cc's, is about 500 cc's in volume. These um, are rare clinically, but they do occur. And so that's a gene that is related to the production of brain size. And it's not the only one that's been found. HAR1 is another one. When HAR1 is uh, present in a copy that's not functional, what happens to the brain is the brain starts to look um, smooth. It doesn't have all the curvy contours. So the volume of the cortical surface is dramatically reduced. So that brain looks more like a brain of a, a lower mammal than a typical human. Both of these show up in clinics. Um, HAR1 is, uh, is a very devastating uh, condition. But both of these genes somehow, because we know what goes wrong when they're um, not properly uh, coding, is something to do with brain size. The theory is that these certainly must be genes that have been important in increasing human brain size because they've been changing in humans. And these are not the only ones. There's about five that have been identified in the last couple of years that were clearly changing rapidly and are giving rise to the larger brain in human beings. So here's my summary of that. <clears throat> um, I borrowed from da Vinci for this. I didn't want to use a picture of a uh, boring human, so. Um, whoops, let me go back here. Uh, HAR1 is uh, the one I just told you about that produces a smooth cortex instead of a, uh, uh, a normal properly folded cortex. Um, ASPM produces a small brain. FOXP2 is a language gene. And quick aside here, this was discovered about um, early 2000s, maybe 2001, and the newspaper report said the gene for language has been discovered. Bad reporting. It was not the gene for language. There's no such thing as the gene for language. Um, there's lots of genes that impact language. This is one of them, and it's not the gene. There's probably no magical one gene for language. Um, but it clearly does affect it. It was discovered in Britain in a, a, a small family of individuals that had problems articulating. They have problems using proper syntax and grammar. Um, but otherwise, they're able to understand language perfectly. So it affects one component of the circuitry that produces normal human language. Um, we don't know the full complement of other genes that affect language, but they're being discovered as we go. Um, HAR2 is uh, a a gene that has changed dramatically recently, and it affects the hands. And we don't know quite what it does yet, but the suspicion is since it's dramatically changed, and we are tool users, that it might turn out to be important to the way we manipulate with our hands. And LCT, I want to tell you about really quickly, that's the lactase gene. And this is really important, because the lactase gene is something that allows us to process milk sugar uh, effectively in our digestive tracts. Now, all humans have it active when they're young. But in most human populations, that gene becomes silent and afunctional after weaning, so it's not used. It turns out that in northern Europeans, the gene stays active. It turns out that in three different geographic regions of Africa, that gene stays active. And the reason is because those people became herders, and they brought goats, and they brought cattle in, and they milked them, and they used milk as a, an important foodstuff. And this probably happened between 10,000 and 5,000 years ago. 
So this is a cultural practice that has led to a selection pressure causing gene changes in the human. So this is a really fascinating area. And it means, and it's just kind of taken off again, that there is an interaction between genetics and culture at a level that people didn't appreciate before. And I'm sure this has gladdened the heart of many an anthropologist to realize that culture is having such a direct effect on biology. We always knew it, but this is one of the better examples of it. So the things that are happening in the human uh, evolutionary story are not just genes changing and genes reading out information. It's also culture happening and culture influencing the way genes get selected. So there's a definite interplay there between behavior, social conditions, and the way the brain develops. Okay, I'm going to skip this because I don't want to take the time. I'm going to go to um, one last point. Um, and I'm going to end on this. This is a, a picture from a paper that came out about a year ago, and it's from a new area called connectomics. So as we go along, we're creating whole new fields in biology. Um, what this basically is is a, a map of all the connections in the human brain that are of any significance. And it was gathered by doing MRI-like scans of the brain in a special way that instead of looking at, um, you know, quite often we'll look at things like blood flow to a region of the brain to figure out if it's highly active. What this tends to do is tends to look at the structure of the white matter, the connections between different brain areas, and assesses their integrity, their thickness, and how likely they are to be a strong connection. And this is done in an unbiased way. So you don't go in and say, let's find out how the visual area is connected to the touch area. You just simply say, let somebody sit in the scanner, scan the brain, and find out what the connections look like. And it turns out that across a series of individuals that were scanned, they came up with roughly similar maps. And when you do an informatics crunch of all the information there, what you get is on the right. That's a, somebody's called sort of a subway map of the human nervous system. It turns out that all of that complexity can be reduced to a few local hubs. There are one, two, three, four, five, seven there. Um, and those hubs are local nodes where there's strong connections in and out, and then they're each interconnected to the other. So while there may be 10 to the 15th um, connections in the human brain, and that's a very large number, that's billions of billions, the only way to make sense of that is to reduce it to something like this. And the interesting thing about this is, this probably was mostly done by graduate students who were training in informatics, which is sort of a hybrid between biology these days and computer science. And they were probably not touching any live creatures. They were probably at the computer. And what they were expert in is going to databases all over the world, finding information, um, and scaling it up against this, because now we're trying to look at gene expression against maps like this. So there's a whole cadre of scientific endeavor here that has to look at systems like this and try to analyze in an abstract way what's the nature of the complexity here. It turns out these connections are not random. They obey certain principles of complex systems. And there's a whole new science that's evolved to look at this. And um, when you look at it, it turns out that one of the things that's fun here, it turns out that this was recently done for the fruit fly. And you're going to hear about fruit flies later. I'm not going to tell you any details here. But it turns out that at a formal level, the subway map for the fruit fly brain has the same general organizing principles as the subway map for the human brain. It has about the same number of key nodes. It has the same properties of interconnection. Um, and by the way, I wasn't too surprised because I work on insects, and I know insects do really complicated things. So there's a good reason for that. Um, OK, so let me just go to the summary. So real quickly, the points I wanted to emphasize were just that the while the brains have many similarities, there are some nuanced differences, not large differences, at the molecular level. And some of those are probably going to be terribly important for things like learning and memory. And you'll hear about some of those, I think, from Rich as, as we get into the next week. Um, it's really small changes at the cellular and genetic levels that probably can ex uh, explain major shifts in behavioral capacity. In a complex system, a small shift in connections can lead to a major shift in behavioral outcomes. And then last but not least, brain circuitry really is highly flexible. And this is something I'm going to come back and talk about again at the final week in a brief way to talk about how it relates to um, changes in the brain in children and, I think, how we want to be thinking about education in an environment where the brain is dynamically and flexibly changing. And 
it seems to me very important that we know over what time course it changes, how its inputs can be used, and that we design educational curricula so we take full advantage of that. Um, so more on that on March 22nd, and I'll be glad to answer questions now. Can you hear me now? OK. Um, we're going to have some mics around the room, so just hold up your hand if you want to ask a question. I forgot to mention to you at the very beginning, and Chris is going to try to get his footage going here, um, that on the back of your program, you have a free pass to the um, uh, Hands-On Science Museum over in the Skaggs building, and they're having a an exhibit called The Brain, A World Inside Your Head, and it's going until March. So you have a free pass to go over there. This, this tells you on the program what the hours are and that kind of thing. So if you're interested in this and you want to do a little bit of outside research or homework or anything like that, feel free to pop on over there and use your free pass. Uh, did you get it, Chris? Or? Let me show you this. This is uh, 10 minutes in the life of a cortical neuron. I'm not going to monkey with it. Do that one more time. So uh, when this were first seen, they really can't hear you. When those were first seen, they really amazed people because it looks like an amoeba more than a, a typical brain cell as we think of it. So, questions, anybody? Uh, right, right here, Jay, right in the middle there, in the second part. You want to use this? How... Um, Static are the brain maps in view of neuronal motility? Uh, they're really dynamic. Um, I have a feeling that um, one of the later speakers is going to show you some examples of this, but um, there's some famous experiments where um, you can train a monkey to use its hand differentially. So you record from the brain and kind of map out the hand representation. You train that monkey to um, play with textured surfaces to get a reward. And you can literally, over the space of perhaps a week, see the representation of that, the, the specific fingers used in the discrimination will expand in the brain. And those kinds of changes wouldn't be happening unless we had dynamic changes in cells of the sort that you just saw on the screen there. So the theory is that both at that cellular level and with some important gating processes that are at the molecular level, those kinds of um, changes become allowed. Uh-huh, over here. Um, Dan, Dan Spencer. Uh, Chris, I was really interested in the, um, the example you gave about the asymmetry in the brain that was reflected both in human brains and chimps' brains and um, seems to be related to speech in humans, but not, not that in chimps, which suggests maybe that that asymmetry evolved uh, under different adaptive pressures or something, but then created the capacity for a later adaptation of humans, perhaps completely unrelated to the original pressure. And, and I'm wondering, how often do we, are we seeing that kind of thing where some evolutionary change evolves in an adaptive behavior, but that then creates a capacity for a different um, behavior altogether that wouldn't have arisen without that capacity, but didn't arise because of that adaptive pressure, if that makes any sense. No, it, it does, and <clears throat> that's a good question because um, it makes the point that evolution is a very conservative process, and it, it, it can't reinvent the materials that it's going to use to make something. It has to use what it has already in a living body. And whatever the adaptive um, niche was that allowed for brain asymmetry, it happened at a certain time, and then it was used and was useful for certain needs later on. Those couldn't have been predicted because evolution is not that kind of a process. But that happens all the time. So evolution is a deeply conservative process. It uses what it has. And quite often, you can track back and show that an adaptive change here that was useful for one purpose, several million years later, 
it's still in the population, but now it's useful for something else, and evolution can make use of it. So that's a very common happening. Anybody else? More questions? Uh -huh. Back there in the back, I think Tom. I was very intrigued by the uh, cultural uh, changes that can uh, influence the uh, brain structure. And uh, could you just address uh, briefly uh, the epigenetic influence of uh, brain uh, structure and function? And uh, you mentioned, you know, that genetics is a very slow conservative process, but that in epigenetics this can speed up the process significantly and uh, where this is going in the future. <clears throat> I'm glad you mentioned that too because the, um, you know, the term epigenesis means the ability of environmental information to influence gene expression in a way where it gets stably passed on from one generation to the next. And there were classically a few examples of that that were known and they were considered to be kind of rare. And if you've been among professional biologists in the last five to 10 years, suddenly the term epigenesis and epigenetics has recurred again, and there's been enormous numbers of examples out there. And it's very clear that some of the complexity of the human genome is related to the fact that it can take in signals from the outside under certain circumstances and incorporate that into gene expression. And there's been a couple of studies that were done in Europe um, showing that, uh, you know, in a couple of countries where they have really good health records, you could track back and find out that um, a mother's behavior while she was pregnant influence the offspring in a way that was then passed on to the next generation. And as you can imagine, this is not something we expect to see happening. So when it did happen, those publications were scrutinized and, and people looked for replications. Um, it looks like that's really true. And I would say that if I had to predict what's going to be a really important uh, intellectual challenge in the next 10 years in the life sciences, and it's not just biology. This will affect anthropology. It'll affect sociology. It's going to be epigenetics. Um, we don't fully understand how it works. Um, there's a few good examples now where the details have been probed by geneticists. Um, but to know that the human genome is that flexible um, is really kind of startling. And it, it's really a whole new generation of uh, research that'll be done. I had a question. You mentioned that most of the signals are neurotransmitters, but there's other ways that information is being communicated in the brain. Can you talk about that? Oh, sure. Um, <clears throat> I had a slide in here that I took out because uh, I had hundreds of slides. It was The hard thing was to get it down to a manageable number. Um, there's a lot of things floating around in the brain that have really high impact on um, brain function. So for example, um, that chart I showed you where I was trying to explain that the chemicals in the brain are rather ancient, many of them, not all. Um, it turns out that you could do the similar thing for hormones and that you can look back and say, okay, we have a, a set of hormones in our body that control physiological functions. Um, how ancient are those? Well, a lot of those hormones can be found in things like yeast. So they're very ancient. Um, hormones get into the brain. They powerfully influence different brain centers. Um, another area that's really important that I find fascinating and uh, once again, it's relatively recent is to look at the connection between the immune system and the brain. Um, Lymphocytes in the immune system um, spritz little chemicals back and forth called cytokines all the time, which signal between them. And some cells in the brain are sensitive to those cytokines. In addition, many of the lymphocytes are sensitive to neurotransmitters and hormones. So there's a two-way traffic between your immune system and your brain all the time. Um, now, it's humbling because the, the immune system is so complicated. Um, sometimes I think it makes the nervous system seem simple. Um, it has a huge number of cells, but instead of being relatively fixed like they are in the brain, they're floating free in your blood system. Uh, the immune system is capable of memory. It's capable of learning. So it's an incredibly immense dispersed information system, and it's talking to the nervous system all the time. So um, imagine a field that could take into account all the complexity of the brain and then at the same time factor in the chemical complexity of the immune system and the endocrine system. So all of these signals are available to the brain and many different brain centers are listening to some of those chemical signals. Oh, I'm sorry, Royce. Chris, I have a question about the surface area of the brain. 
So usually when a structure has a particularly high surface area, it means something about the exchange uh, between that structure and its surroundings. Is that playing a role here? Is the brain exchanging information with the fluid in which it resides, or is it just to optimize that outer few millimeters of the tissue? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I suspect that uh, certainly nutrients are exchanged with some of the surrounding fluid. Um, the, the blood vessels must conform in some way to the funny geometry uh, of the cortex. And um, I suspect it's not so much for, uh, we tend to think of it as being for packing circuitry effectively into that structure rather than for something like metabolic exchange in any simple way. Yeah, so the question was, do I see a connection between the way the immune system operates and the way the olfactory system operates to process smell information? Um, that's an interesting question. I guess I would say at a certain level, yes. Um, the, when you study basic biology, one of the things you have to do is spend a little bit of time on the immune system because it does some really amazing things with um, shuffling genetic information to make all the different antibodies. And that's an incredibly important paradigm. Um, there's millions of antigens in the world, and we can recognize a huge number of those. And we have specific antibodies for all of them, and we make those through genetic techniques, but there aren't enough genes in our body to code specifically for that, so we reshuffle genetic information during the development of the immune system. The nervous system probably does a bit of that, at least in a formal sense. And that um, graph I showed you, it had a cartoon of the human brain, and it showed the postsynaptic receptor mechanisms and it showed them being shuffled in different colors. That could well be something of the same sort, that some of the receptor um, complexity could be through a mechanism a little bit like the immune system where some of that information is differentially uh, shuffled between um, genes that are being expressed. Um, in the case of the um, olfactory system, there is some interesting information about how um, differential gene expression gives rise to the different kinds of receptors across the uh, nasal epithelium. But I'm not an expert in that. I don't know if you could draw a close analogy between that and the immune system. I think it's probably scaled completely differently. I yeah. was wondering, um, can you talk about some of the interesting differences between men's brains and women's brains? And is there a stronger connection between the endocrine system and the woman's brain? I was hoping I wouldn't get asked that. Um, <laughs> could I explain the differences between men's and women's brains, okay. basically? <laughs> um, Gosh, if I could do that. Um, He'd never have to work again. I, yeah, really. Um, I mean, clearly, you know, I remember vividly in college reading an article on, on sex differences in the brain, and I thought, wow, this is going to explain everything. And I read the article, and what it really said was that in the female brain, of course, there's interesting connections between the hypothalamus and the um, pituitary to explain menstrual cycle. Okay, well, that's not too surprising. So that, I wouldn't call that a profound difference, um, but it's certainly real. Now, people have gone out and looked in many different dimensions to see what kind of specific differences they can find. Um, and the trouble with this is um, until it's been replicated a number of times, you never know what to think about it. So, for example, there was a report, oh, gosh, I don't know, eight years ago maybe, about the corpus callosum being a bit different in terms of numbers of fibers between men and women. Um, and not the whole corpus callosum, but certain regions of the corpus callosum. That's the, the region that connects bundles of fibers between the two sides of the brain. And some of that has been replicated and some of it hasn't. And frankly, even though it's been partly replicated, I couldn't tell you what it means functionally. Um, those kinds of questions are beyond, I think, what we know in a really specific operational way right now. So I guess I would have to say that there are certainly um, you know, you can, if you search the uh, web right now, you'll find lots of research, published research, showing some differences between male brains and female brains. I would point out that most of those are differences on average. That is to say, there are very little absolute differences between the two brains. And that they're more similar to each other than they are different. The immune system connection, um, uh, I wouldn't be qualified to answer that. I, I, I think it'd be a fascinating question because the, 
so my intuition is there's some really deep connections between the immune system and the nervous system that we've, we've seen just the tip of. Um, one of the great researchers who studied language and brain lateralization was convinced that the degree of lateralization of the brain was connected to the competence of the immune system in some way and actually had some evidence that that might be true. But the mechanisms for it are very unclear. Um, and I guess at this point I just have to say that when you have two systems of that complexity, there's so much more we need to know before we could point to specific instances of how one affects the other. Yeah. When you say, you know, the brain circuitry is highly flexible, have you studied brains that have been injured and how quickly the brain can adapt, you know, the flexibility of the brain to adapt for an injured brain? Yes. Um, so how does the injured brain respond? Um, there's a lot of information on that. Um, many experiments have been done to look at what happens when one section of the brain is damaged, what kind of compensatory changes take place. Um, I had a slide in there which I took out because just I, I couldn't fit it, but maybe I'll show it um, on the 22nd of March. Um, the new um, brain imaging techniques, um, the thing I was showing you that had that subway-like map, that's being applied now to look at people in cases like stroke, where region of the brain has been damaged. And it's been really interesting because there have been a paper, a couple of papers in the last year that showed, you know, it's not hard to look on a brain scan and say, oh, there's a region that the brain was deprived of oxygen and the cells have maybe died and they're not functioning. But what about the rest of the brain? It's a massively interconnected system. And these new um, diffusion tensor imaging uh, techniques allow you to ask the question, subsequent to that lesion from the the uh, stroke, have you seen changes in connections to other parts of the brain? The answer is yes, fairly quickly. So you see functional shifts in the way that uh, brain is interconnected. And I think a lot of study will have to be done before we know what the significance of that is. But I guess the, the hopeful thing is, at least at this level, we have a non-invasive tool that can, you can use to look at a brain surrounding the time of something like a stroke and see what kind of changes are there. And Seeing them is one thing, and then doing something to sort of alleviate the uh, unwanted changes is something else. And, you know, there's, there's not much you can do once you've, you've gone into the neuroradiology suite and you've seen the changes unless you know the actual molecular mechanism. And that's where uh, studies like the kind that uh, Rich Bridges does get at how do you treat these cases? How, how do you know how to control or gate the plasticity that might be there? And that's really the key to it, right? If you know the brain is flexible, we know that there are some chemical um, properties that change up and down, can regulate the amount of plasticity. If you can learn to turn it on and turn it on selectively when it's needed for a damaged brain, you might be able to lead to very improved outcomes for people that have had a stroke, for example. That's a huge area of interest right now. The, if you went on Google, the number of hits you'd get for um, brain changes following stroke would be, you know, many thousands. All the smartest people are left-handed. What right. can I? <laughs> How many people clapped? <laughs> well, that's not quite as contentious as explaining the difference between men and women. But um, no, the, um, there, there's a whole host of really interesting correlations with that. Um, one of the things I would point out, and that is, you know, I'm a zoologist by training. So when I think about that as a question for human behavior, I immediately jump to the fact that there's lots of handedness in the animal kingdom. Um, Lots of the neural asymmetries we see in humans um, turn out to be present in lots of other creatures. So for example, when birds sing, they tend to use one side of the brain to control singing, not the other. Um, what we tend not to see is splits in the population like we do in humans where some subset does it one way and another subset does it another. In birds, it's pretty much all the left side of the brain controls singing. Um, but no, I wouldn't want to venture to explain left-handedness in any mystical sense. It's just a gift. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Thanks, everybody, very much. I think we have to stop now, but we'll see you again next week. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>